And dear Heavenly Father, what a joy and privilege it is to be able to study your word. And we thank you for um, this 10th chapter of John as we open it up tonight and, and we look at it. And um, Again, we um, just are so uh, thankful that you've given us uh, your son and that you have uh, allowed us um, insight into scripture and that you've uh, given us BSF as that vehicle, at least this week. And so we just pray, uh, pray for those that couldn't make it tonight, that uh, that we'll all get a chance to to come back next week. And uh, we do thank you for uh, this church and opening its doors to us tonight. And so we pray uh, now that you would speak to us through your word. And we ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if you were to look at my college transcripts, uh, you would see only A's and B's. Uh, but that's not because I got all A's and B's. It was just that I had a schedule that allowed me to retake a couple classes my senior year of college, uh, one of which was college algebra. And the reason I struggled wasn't because I can't do math. Rather, it's because I had three full years uh, off since I'd taken algebra in high school. But my high school math algebra teacher had told me my 10th grade year, he said, keep a notebook, keep it up to date, keep it accurate, and save it for college. And I did a good job of keeping that notebook clear and organized, but sometime between 1990 and 1993, uh, that notebook disappeared. And as hard as I looked for it, I never could find it. So uh, by the time I got to that college algebra class, uh, it was just a distant memory. And uh, I think that's the way it is with a lot of things. Um, if we don't keep things fresh in our mind and accurate and organized, um, our memories fade. And so what do we do? You know, we write stuff down. And we review. And so uh, tonight really is no different. So we've been off for a, a month now from the book of John. Uh, so things might be getting just a little fuzzy. Where did we leave off? Where, uh, where were we? What's the time frame? What's the setting? And so let me do what I've done a couple of times in the past few years, and that is review in just a few minutes our first semester um, and, and just kind of give a brief overview of that. And then we'll move on into the text of the week. So John 1 uh, really, the first 18 verses, we have what's known as the prologue. I'm sure you guys all remember that. seems like it was just not that long ago. Uh, obviously, some of the best theology in all of Scripture. Uh, verse 1, John 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. John was so precise with those words. Uh, for him to say that Jesus Christ was God just kind of sums up the book right from the start. Now, the theme of John's Gospel, we, we know, is found in the very end of the book. And we've already looked at that many times, John 20, 31. Uh, these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. That's the real theme of John, that Jesus is God, that the Son and the Father are one. Jesus is Messiah on every page. Uh, the, the other Gospels, they're different. You know, Matthew was presented Jesus as the promised king. Uh, Mark presented him as a servant. Luke presented Jesus as a perfect man. Uh, when you get to the Gospel of John, it's a completely uh, different dimension. And so we begin this Gospel, heaven opens up, and the first thing we see is the eternal Son of God descending. And so that's John's message. Behold your God. And the next thing we see is that Jesus is introduced as light coming into the world, into our dark world. And we see a brief introduction then of another John, not the writer, uh, but this one is the last Old Testament prophet, John the Baptist. Uh, he came to prepare the people's hearts to receive Christ, and it's also right here, right at the beginning of the book, where we begin to see in greater detail what we will later tonight, and that is opposition. At first, it's opposition towards John the Baptist from this group called the Jews. Now, you might remember that's the term John uses to refer to the religious leaders who oppose Jesus. And so in the last part of chapter 1, those Jews came to John the Baptist, asked him who he was. And he asked him all those questions, and his answer was simply this, I'm a voice. Uh, they, he, they quotes Isaiah 40, he says, I'm just a voice, but behold the Lamb of God, right? That's when John's disciples leave him and begin to follow after Jesus. And so by the end of that first chapter, Jesus is already has this very small following. Um, and so then chapter 2 opens, we begin to see the authority of Jesus in his first miracle, creating wine. And one of the ideas from that section is this. Genuine faith does not require a sign. The Jews wanted a sign, but all that did was show that they didn't believe. Uh, so Jesus clears out the religious hypocrisy in the temple in that same chapter, fulfilling Malachi's prophecy at the same time. And the chapter ended this way. Many people saw the miraculous signs he was doing and believed in his name, but, but Jesus would not entrust himself to them, for he knew all men. And then as a representation of those men, 
We know Nicodemus shows up in chapter 3, which is where we learn of the new birth. Verse 3, chapter 3, I tell you the truth, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. You cannot come to God, Nicodemus, unless you scrap all your works-based religion and give your life fully to Christ. But then Jesus explained why the people won't come. Men love darkness instead of light. Why? Because their deeds were evil. And in chapter 4, Jesus gives us a preview of the Gentiles turning to him by drawing a Samaritan woman to himself. And if you remember, he drew her to repentance first by confronting her sin. And in chapter 5, uh, he returns to Jerusalem. There's this uh, back to work at, at disrupting the Pharisees' notions about worship. He did that by healing a paralytic man on the Sabbath. And we see a lot of that in the Gospels. This is also, we, we see the very first plot by the Jews to kill Jesus. What happens from that is Jesus defends himself by giving several witnesses uh, to verify his Messiahship. John the Baptist, his works, God the Father, the Old Testament, Moses. And in chapter 6, we looked at the popular miracle of the feeding of the 5,000. And Jesus got um, the people the, the, you know, the food, and the people got so excited that the crowds attempted to force him to be their king, to make him their king. And so Jesus withdrew and then miraculously met his disciples on the lake in the middle of the night. And the next day, Jesus made the, the first of his many I am statements. And we'll be looking at those, uh, the first one he said, he was the true bread of life that came down from heaven. And in order to come to God, you must appropriate Jesus Christ. You must take all of him into your life. We spent a couple of weeks in that discourse, 71 verses in that chapter. Uh, the next chapter, we see Jesus secretly going to the Feast of Tabernacles, but then later publicly teaching. And he taught that those who reject him will never enter heaven, no matter how sincere. And then the hostility and the division uh, that we'll see full-blown tonight continues to heat up. It was the division between those who believed Jesus was Messiah and those who were stuck in their unbelief. And if you remember, those that didn't believe tried to trap him in theological arguments. That's when they, they brought him the woman caught in adultery. And then really what they asked him was this, how do you harmonize justice and mercy? And if you remember, the answer is Jesus Christ. Mercy and justice were harmonized at the cross. At the cross. And so Jesus made it very clear in 821 with these solemn words, I am going away and you will look for me and you will die in your sins. Where I go, you cannot come. And then there is a dialogue back and forth between Jesus and the Jews, ending with Jesus' clear claim to be God, where he said, I tell you the truth, before Abraham was born, I am. And had that not been true, the Jewish response to pick up stones at that point would have been the right thing to do. But his words were clear, and his words were true. He is the great I am. And so what started as a plot to kill him ended up as only an attempt. Why? Because his time had not yet come. And so Jesus, once again, slips away, miraculously unharmed. Which brings us right to where we left off, right before the Christmas break, John chapter 9. Uh, last time we met back in December, we studied the passage about Jesus healing the man who was born blind. And you might think that most of the people would be glad to be a part of a miracle like that. It was an amazing thing. But instead, all the Jewish religious leaders did was look for reasons to indict Jesus. And this is what he finally said to them in John 9, 39. For judgment I've come into this world, so the blind will see, and those who see will become blind. Jesus was telling the religious leaders they were the ones who were spiritually blind. So to illustrate their lack of understanding, Jesus goes directly to where we are this week in chapter 10. But first we need to understand um, some figures of speech in what we're going to see this week. So one term we need to understand is the expression poroimia. It's a Greek word, me. The best way to explain it is, it is an allegory. It is a proverb, a cryptic saying of some sort, a figurative language. Uh, you might remember this from English class, maybe not. Terms like metaphors and similes. I'll give you a refresher. A metaphor is a figure of speech where you describe something as though it is something. Or a simile, on the other hand, is where you compare two objects using the words like or as. Here's a couple of illustrations. A metaphor, a clean slate, has nothing to do with a chalkboard. It's a fresh start, right? Heart stopping, your heart really doesn't stop. You're just surprised. But a simile compares things like this. Cold as ice fits like a glove. Those are used in the Gospels much more frequently. Similes are usually noted by the term parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed. It will be like a man going on a journey. But there are no similes in the book of John. Instead, he uses a figure of speech known as a paroimia. It's more like a metaphor. Notice in this week's passage, Jesus didn't say, I am like a shepherd. He said, I am the shepherd. He didn't say, I'm like a gate. He said, I am the gate. And so the difference between this and a parable, but the thing is this, they were both used for the same reason. Uh, Jesus uses confusing language 
and simple stories at the same time about everyday life for the same reasons. He uses them for two reasons. Number one, so that some wouldn't understand. And number two, so that some would understand. So he uses them to reveal and to also to conceal. So if you go back to the end of chapter 9, and if you will, go ahead and turn there in your Bibles if you haven't already. If you go back to chapter 9 in John, Jesus healed the man who had been born blind. And after this long interrogation, Jesus gives this paroimia. He'd been kicked out of the synagogue. He told the Jews they were spiritually blind. And, and it gets to this very end of the world, the very end of this chapter, and it says the blind will see and those who see will become blind. Um, but first, we'll stop here and we'll... Just get a quick takeaway from this, uh, from this lesson, from this review. And we have a spiritual principle or a spiritual lesson here in this opening nine chapters. I think the, the principle is simply this. The only cure for spiritual blindness is Jesus Christ. Amen. The only cure for spiritual blindness is Jesus Christ. Here at the very end of chapter 9, Jesus said this, For judgment I have come into the world, so the blind will see, and those who see will become blind. And some of the Pharisees who heard him say this, asked, What, are we blind too? Jesus said, If you were blind, you would not be guilty of sin, but now that you claim you can see, your guilt remains. The problem in chapter 9 was Israel had false shepherds who led them away from the true shepherd. But even when Jesus talks to them like this, they still don't get it. The others who are with him, the disciples, the formerly blind man, they understand perfectly. So we have to understand what it takes to become spiritually blind. What does it take? It takes nothing. You see, we were born blind. We were born into sin. Every one of us is spiritually blind already. We can't see God. We can't see reality. We can't see the spiritual dimension. No one can see any of that except through the illuminating work of the Spirit of God. And so there are the blind who will never see, and there are the blind who are made to see. And the whole world is made up of two kinds of people, the blind who can't see and the blind who now can see. So I guess the question we need to ask ourselves is, which group am I in? Can I see true spiritual reality? Do I understand real spiritual matters? You, know, you can flip through radio stations or TV channels and find people talking about what they call spiritual things. And yet, in reality, many are spiritually blind. So how do you know what is true and what is false? The only way to tell is to stay in the Word. So aren't you glad we've started back up in 2024? And we can jump right back into this book. Think about it. It's been a month since we last met. But here in this passage, the only break in the text is the recent 800-year-old chapter division. There was no break whatsoever in the setting. And so the passage ended in chapter 9 with the words I just read. If you were blind, you would not be guilty of sin. But now you claim you see your guilt remains. And the very next words out of Jesus' mouth are verse 1, chapter 10. I tell you the truth. What Jesus does here is illustrate the fact that religious were the ones who are spiritually blind. He uses a paroimia, not to explain it, but to sovereignly conceal the truth from these men. Follow along, starting in chapter 10, verse 1. The man who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate, but climbs in some other way, is a thief and a robber. The man who enters by the gate is the shepherd of his sheep. The watchman opens the gate for him, and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of him, and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. In these first five verses, Jesus uses this metaphor that would have been understood by all those in Palestine. In Israel, the land is best suited not for farming, but for sheep herding. And so to understand the spiritual implications, we need to understand these terms. In each village, uh, there was always a common area of town. Um, the center of the village somewhere was a common sheepfold, and all of the shepherds in that village would have their sheep out grazing in the hillside during the day, and then at night they would lead their sheep into this common sheep pen. And the, sheep, the shepherd would, would go home and, and rest and sleep, and the porter or the watchman uh, would then keep an eye on the sheep. Now when you bring a sheep in, something symbolic happened. The, the shepherd would bring all of his sheep up to the door, and they would, he would take out his rod and he would put it down, and under the, ship, under the, the rod of the shepherd, each sheep would go into the pen and the, could inspect them. The symbolism is pretty clear in Ezekiel 20, verse 37. It says, I will take note of you as you pass under my rod, 
and I will bring you into the land of the covenant. And so in Ezekiel, God is seen as the shepherd. And although there are a lot of interpretations as to what the sheepfold represents, many think that it represents Israel. If that's true, the obvious conclusion is that the false shepherds represented the Jewish leaders at the time. There's nothing new for Israel. They had a long list of centuries of bad leaders. Isaiah chapter 56, 700 years before Jesus, the prophet describes the Jewish leaders like this. Israel's watchmen are blind. They all lack knowledge. They are shepherds who lack understanding. They all turn to their own way. Each seeks his own gain. But of course, false shepherds were nothing new. Um, in Bible times, it was, they still played the church today. Matthew 7, Jesus said this, Watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing. In orderly, they are ferocious wolves. In Acts 20, Peter warns the church in Ephesus, After I leave, savage wolves will come in among you. Until finally, in the end, there will be one final false shepherd predicted in Zechariah 11. I am going to raise up a shepherd over the land who will not care for the lost or seek the young or heal the injured or feed the healthy, but he will eat the meat of choice sheep, tearing off their hooves. Many scholars think the prophet is talking about the coming Antichrist. And so it's clear the prophet here, this isn't just a warning for Jesus' day. This is also for us today. We need to be careful about what we read and what we study. Stick to the word, right? Notice what the text says. The sheep listen to his voice, and they know his voice. Actual sheep recognize the voice of their shepherd. Even today, if someone tries to imitate the voice of a shepherd, the sheep won't listen to him. It's the same way. True believers should not or will not listen to false teachers. In verse 6, it says, Jesus used this figure of speech, this paroimia, but they did not understand what he was telling them. Frequently, the greatest pretenders of knowledge are the most ignorant about the things of God. And Jesus told them, verse 7, I tell you the truth, I am the gate for the sheep. And so now we see a switch in the metaphor. In the first five verses, Jesus contrasted the difference between himself and false shepherds. However, now he claims to be the gate. So first he was the shepherd, and now he's the gate. But it's really a mixed metaphor um, because he hasn't stopped being the shepherd, and yet he's now the gate. So how can Jesus be the shepherd and the gate at the same time? And it's very simple. You may have even heard this before, but in the summer when it was warm, sometimes the shepherds would stay out at night with their sheep. And they would find a little valley or some other kind of natural structure, and, the, and the, he would pin the sheep in for the night. They have to be somewhere with only one natural entrance. Uh, so the shepherd himself would then sleep at that entrance, thus making sure the sheep didn't get out at night and that nothing got in to harm them. Uh, so using this metaphor, Jesus was stating the same thing, that he was the only way in. In essence, he's the shepherd at the same time he's also the gate. And he says this anyway in the next few verses. Verse 8, all whoever came before me were thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. You see, you can't get through in Old Testament Judaism or any other false system of religion. How do you get in? Verse 9, I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. He will come in and go out and find pasture. He's the gate. He's the door. He's the only way. Only Christ can save you. And that word saved implies such an obvious alternative to the opposite word lost. But if you're saved, look what you get. Verse 10, abundant life. The thief comes only to kill and destroy. I have come that you may have life and have it to the full. Uh, it's a contrast that makes it so attractive, though. This is not a verse that you really want to base your entire life theology on, but it's still a beautiful promise. Look at the contrast. Steal, kill, destroy versus life to the full. I don't think we can even understand the whole concept here. The un uh, we, we can't fathom the blackness of eternal hell. I mean, Jesus used many illustrations for hell, all of which were horrific scenes. But in contrast to that is the abundant life that Christ offers both here and in heaven for eternity. I don't think we often appreciate what Jesus has available for those who follow him. I think there's a principle here in this first chapter uh, that we need to stop and consider. And that first principle here for this Second part, I guess, is the matchless gift of eternal life exceeds anything imaginable. The matchless gift of eternal life exceeds anything imaginable. Uh, if you look up that word for Greek, the Greek word for abundant, it describes something that goes far beyond what's necessary. 
It is a full life that begins here on earth, goes on to eternity in, in heaven with Christ. Romans 11.33 says, Oh, the depths of the riches of the wisdom and the knowledge of God, how unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. But that kind of life only comes to those who are his sheep. Remember, they're the only ones who hear his voice. And so on one hand, you have to ask yourself if you're spiritually blind. Or you could ask it another way. Am I truly one of his sheep? I mean, what a great way to start the new year, making the commitment to Christ. Or for those who might be asking, well, I'm already a follower of Jesus, right? Well, we need to ask this. Am I a healthy follower of Jesus? Am I being enriched in his word every day? Am I spending time talking and listening to him? How will you distinguish the true shepherd from the false shepherds unless you know him? The only way is by feeding in his green pastures, right? He is the good shepherd. And that's also what we see of him in the next section, which is where Jesus makes the distinction between himself and the hired hand. And so verse 11 says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. This is the fourth I am statement in the book of John. I am the good shepherd. The phrase here should literally read this way. I am the good one, preeminent and excellent in every feature. And that singles out Jesus because he's not just another shepherd. Because, of course, in the Jewish mind, who in their history was their greatest shepherd? I would say it was probably King David. But isn't it interesting that back in chapter 5, Jesus was greater than Moses. In chapter 8, he was greater than Abraham. And what now Jesus is saying is he's greater than even King David. He's shooting down all their arguments, so their unbelief is without excuse. It's also worthy to note that all those men that Jesus compared himself to, they were all shepherds. Abraham, even Isaac and Jacob. Moses, even the great King David, all shepherds, all pictures of the coming good shepherd who would save his people from their sin. How? By laying down his life. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Ultimately, Christ would eventually give himself over to the wolves and the thieves and the robbers, and he would lay down his life. Now, he wouldn't lay down his life as a shepherd, but rather as a sheep. And not as a picture of a sacrifice, like in the Old Testament but is the actual, sacrificial, atoning Lamb of God. Uh, moving on, verses 12 and 13, there's a contrast between the true shepherd and the hired hand. The hired hand is not the shepherd who owns the sheep. And so when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. The wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he has a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. Now, if you've ever rented a car, you probably understand that that rental doesn't get treated like your own car, does it? And that's true. And so Jesus is just using the same universal truth to show the danger of these false shepherds. They were mercenaries doing ministry, not for truth, not for love, but for selfish reasons. Contrast that with Jesus, verse 14. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. The reason he knows his sheep is because he loves them. The word for know here indicates the most intimate love relationship. Amos 3, 2 says, You only have I known of all the families of the earth. That doesn't mean that God wasn't aware that there were other nations that existed. It was just that God loved Israel. Look at how intimate Christ loves his sheep. He gives a comparison. Verse 15, Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father, I lay down my life for my sheep. Shepherds in that day, if they were a real shepherd, they were absolutely responsible for their sheep. On the other hand, a hired hand was just that. It was just a job, and most of the time they probably didn't care about it. And so when Jesus says, I lay down my life for my sheep, they knew he meant he loved his sheep. And there were other sheep, too, that Jesus also loved. I'm thinking back to chapter 4, the people of Sychar. Verse 16, I have other sheep that are not of this pen. I must bring them also. They, too, will listen to my voice, and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. True unity between Jews and Gentiles is what defines the church. And so how is your attitude to other believers? Is it an attitude of unity, no matter the color of their skin or country of origin? You know, I think I have more in common spiritually with, with a true Christian who is in prison than I do with an unbelieving police officer, if you think about that. Because we're both sheep. We both belong to the same shepherd. At least that's the way it's supposed to be. It's like the relationship between Jesus and his Father. It's defined by obedience. Verse 17, the reason my Father loves me is I lay down my life only to take it up again. Verse 18, no one takes it from me. I lay it down on my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up. This command I receive from my Father. 
this self-proclaimed authority to take up his life only proved he was God when it actually happened six months later. But you see, those words were divisive. Verse 19, at these words, the Jews were again divided. I think Jesus' words are often divisive. Remember last week, one group said, uh, this man is not from God, he does not keep the Sabbath. The other group said, how can a sinner do such miraculous signs? It's the same thing here. Those with a closed mind, verse 20, many of them said, he is demon-possessed, raving mad, why listen to him? But then there's those with an open mind. Verse 21, can a demon open the eyes of the blind? This is the same crowd, remember? And they're still divided, just like today. There are those who embrace Christ and every hard teaching that he says, and there are those who love their sin and refuse to come. And Jesus' teachings, although it was hard, it was clear. I am the gate. I am the good shepherd. He's the only way. There's no way around it. It's exclusive. And that's the thought behind this third principle of the night. The principle is simply this, and that is that the only way to true life is through Jesus alone. The only way to true life is through Jesus alone. Maybe you've heard a question like this posed by genuinely curious people. Is it true that all religions eventually lead to God? But the answer is clear in Scripture, and it's unequivocally no. That's the exclusivity of the gospel. It's disturbing how often we hear people say things, like even preachers sometimes, and they want to somehow soften that up. Who am I to say what God will accept? I don't know. That's not up to me, but it's up to God, right? <clears throat> Listen to what Peter said when he was talking to this same group of religious leaders. Only this time it was after Jesus' death, resurrection, and ascension. And Peter knew his life was on the line. And this is what he said, Acts 4.12. There is no sal there is salvation in no one else. There is no other name under heaven that's given to men, which you will be saved. And so how do we proclaim that message? How do we do it? Do we do it with an attitude of superiority or with pride? No, we should do it in the same way that we came to faith, in humility and in love. Paul tells us in Ephesians 4.15, speak the truth in love. And so how are we doing at that? First, are you speaking truth? Is your message clear? Is it biblical? And second, are you speaking it in love? What is your motivation and what's your attitude? Well, in this last section, there is a break of a couple of months, and we see Jesus reappear at another feast. And so the next two verses take care of the when and the where of, of this uh, last part of this chapter. The when is verse 22. It says, Then came the feast of dedication at Jerusalem. It was winter. Uh, we'll stop there because this last part is set during the Feast of Tabernacles back in October, the first part of the chapter. And now it says it's the Feast of Dedication, so we know it's mid-December. Um, if you don't know what this feast is from your Old Testament study, have no fear, it's not in there. Um, because what John is talking about here is the non-biblical Jewish tradition of Hanukkah. Uh, obviously, Jewish people that you know might have just finished celebrating Hanukkah about three weeks ago, right before Christmas. Uh, most of you know it's celebrated with a menorah. It's the, the nine-branched uh, candelabra. The reason behind that holiday was to celebrate the rededication of Jerusalem's temple after it was desecrated by Syria. You might have heard of this Syrian leader uh, who led that desecration, Antiochus Epiphanes. You might have heard that name. His name meant this, Manifest God the Illustrious Great One. Pretty modest guy. Um, this was a guy that desecrated the temple by slaughtering a pig on the Jewish Old Testament altar to the Greek god Zeus, no less. Uh, he did that because he hated Judaism. He hated Yahweh. And he did everything he could to abolish it, including desecrating the temple right there. And the Jewish people could only take his tyranny for so long. Uh, so after a while, a Jewish man rose to the occasion. His name was Judas Maccabeus. Uh, he was nicknamed the Hammer, and he was a brilliant, patriotic, brave uh, courageous leader. And so by the year 164 BC, Judas Maccabeus had delivered Jerusalem from the hands of Antiochus Epiphanes. And needless to say, it was a great day in Israel. Uh, the temple was immediately cleansed and restored. And so Hanukkah is the commemoration of that revolution that ended with the great cleansing of the Jewish Old Testament temple. And so can you sense the irony of the setting here? Here in this very group, the Jewish people are celebrating their so-called freedom while well, at the same time, they're under Roman occupation. And so that's the when. And now look at me at the where. Verse 23, Jesus was in the temple area walking in Solomon's colonnade. A lot of rabbis would bring their students here to teach, and so it was winter also. They might have been there to stay warm. 
It says in verse 24, the Jews gathered around him. Uh, the New King James actually has it this way. The Jews surrounded him. Uh, that's probably because they wanted to make sure this time he wasn't going to get away. Um, and so in order to help trap him, they ask, how long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Now that was the right question. It was just with the wrong motive. Uh, keep in mind, the Jews weren't looking for an honest answer. They were looking for a reason to kill him. Uh, look at Jesus' answer in verse 25. I did tell you, but you do not believe. I mean, listen to some of the statements that he's already said from earlier in the book and see what you think. John 5, 17, Jesus said to them, My father is always at work to this very day, and I too am working. John 8, 24, I told you that you would die in your sins if you do not believe that I am the one I claim to be. John 8, 58, I tell you the truth, Jesus answered before Abraham was born, I am. And then look at the last part of verse 25, The miracle I do in my father's name is speak for me. You look at back to Isaiah 35, it says, then will the eyes of the blind be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. The lame will leap, the, the lame leap like a deer and the mute tongue shouts for joy. If that's not a description of Jesus' ministry, then I don't know what is. But they still refused to believe. Why? Two reasons. For one, they chose not to believe. Verse 25, you do not believe. But second, they were not chosen to believe. Verse 26, you do not believe because you are not my sheep. Had they been drawn by the Father, they would have been like the others who dropped in worship, like the blind man from the last chapter. So repeating what he said earlier, my sheep listen to my voice, I know them, and they follow me. And so I see a couple of things that true Christians will do to show that they're his. They listen and they follow. It also says Christ knows them, that same sense of love. Christ loves his own. What else does he do for his own? Three things, verse 28. I give them eternal life. They know, will never perish, and no one can snatch them out of my hand. So number one, eternal life, by definition, has no end. Number two, uh, since we did nothing to earn our salvation, there's nothing we can do bad enough to take our salvation from us. And number three, since no one, especially false prophets, are more powerful than Christ, no one can snatch us out of his hand. And then to further solidify the security of a believer, Jesus continues, in verse 29, my father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one can snatch them out of my father's hand. This is the doctrine of eternal security. This is the doctrine that's in your notes this week. Uh, please read that. You might have heard it taught this way. Once saved, always saved, right? And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. It is clear in Scripture, if you are truly saved, you cannot lose your salvation. Romans 8, 39, nothing shall separate us from the love of God. Hebrews 7, 25, he is able to save us to the uttermost. 1 Peter 1, 5, you are kept by the power of God. But I'm sure many of you out there are thinking of those people that you know that seem to have lost their salvation. Maybe years ago they made a profession of faith. Maybe they were baptized, they were confirmed, something like that. Maybe they had been very active in the church for even a very long time. But after a while, they seem to have somehow fallen away. Um, Hebrews 6 talks, talks about those that fall away. And you might think of yourself, well, if you study that passage, you're going to look and you're going to find that it's actually talking about a person who comes very close to salvation, very close to true salvation. In fact, so close, they can almost taste it, but they haven't eaten, they haven't taken in the bread of life. And so they fall away after being so close to true salvation. 1 John 2.19 talks about these same kind of people. They went out from us, but they did not really belong to us. For if they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us. But their going showed that none of them belong to us. You see, true conversion is manifested by remaining in Christ. Scripture is clear. Christ will keep his own. And should someone think that Jesus is, isn't quite strong as God the Father, well, Jesus clears that up to verse 30. I and the Father are one. And like I said, he didn't misspeak. He never backed up and said, oh, I didn't mean to say that. Just like at the end of chapter 8, had his words not been true, the Jews would have been perfectly justified in their decision. But his words were true. So look at what Jesus says to the Jews, who had again picked up stones to stone him. He says to them, verse 32, I've shown you many great miracles from the Father. For which of these do you stone me? This was now their third attempt on his life. And even though Old Testament law allowed for stoning in cases of blasphemy, uh, Roman law did not allow for this type of execution. Nevertheless, this is a mob mentality, and we've seen it before. It's how riots start. Verse 23, we're not stoning you for any of these, replied the Jews, but for blasphemy, because you, a mere man, claim to be God. 
And this is where it gets confusing. Verse 34. Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law, I have said, you are gods? If you call them gods, to whom the word of God came, and the scripture cannot be broken, what about the one whom the Father set apart as his very own into the world? Why do you then accuse me of blasphemy? Because I said, I am God's son. Now this is a tough one, but let's break it down. Right here, Jesus is quoting uh, Psalm 82, 6. In that passage, um, the name that God gave to human judges was the same name for Creator God. Do you know that from Genesis? It's Elohim. He did that because they were doing the work that truly only God can do, and that was to judge. And so in that psalm, God was issuing a warning to unjust Old Testament judges, and God was challenging them to live up to their holy calling. And so what Jesus is saying is this. If God called these sinful men who were judging, if he called them Elohim, then why can't the holy, sinless God incarnate call himself the Son of God? And he throws their own argument right in the middle of it. Scripture cannot be broken. And then he truly proves his point in the next verse. Do not believe me unless I do what my Father does. If Jesus was running around doing what the false shepherds did, there would be no reason to believe him. But he did what his Father did. And they attempt to appeal to he then attempts to appeal to their logic, their reason, verse 38, even though you do not believe me, believe the miracles that you may know and understand that the Father is in me, and I am in the Father. And so they try to seize him, verse 39, but again, what's it say? He escaped their grasp. Another miracle right in front of them, but they failed to believe. And then this little postscript here in the last three verses, it indicates the end of Jesus' public ministry. He leaves in verse 40, goes back across the Jordan where Jesus um, says it, John had been baptizing in the early days, and I love verse 41. Though John never performed a miraculous sign, all that John said about this man was true. And so just like the Jews rejected Jesus based on what he said, these people followed him because of what he was teaching, not because of what he could do for them. And the result of that, verse 42, in that place, many believed in Jesus. So where John began his ministry, Jesus finishes, and many believed. And so what's the lesson from this last part? Uh, what's the spiritual principle we can take away? I think the principle is this. The recognition of Jesus' divinity is a sign of a regenerated mind. The recognition of Jesus' divinity is a sign of a regenerated mind. Now, the Jews didn't see it, but the disciples did. What's the difference? The disciples had been born again. They had been regenerated. When Peter made his great confession about Jesus being Christ, the Son of God, why do you think Jesus told Peter that his father had revealed it to him? Because that's the only way to believe. It's a work of God. That's not just the only way. It's, it's also a test. But it is a test. So, so you have to ask yourself, do I pass? Do I recognize that Jesus is the Son of God? Do I understand what that means? Do we fully grasp what it means that he laid down his life and that he took it up again? Who do you need to tell this wonderful truth to? That God himself came to this world to save us from our sin. And when you share the gospel, do you share the correct truth? Are we, are we bold like Jesus? And if we are, we'll probably get one of two reactions. They will try to seize you, or many will believe so how are we going to live? Are we going to live in fear or live in boldness, knowing that God will hold us securely in his arms? You have to have that security. You really have to trust in Christ alone. That's really the thought behind the main principle tonight. So if we were to sum up the, the main lesson tonight, that final summary principle would be this. Christ's righteousness, not our own, secures salvation. Christ's righteousness, not our own, secures salvation. I'll have you know I took that straight out of the notes. Uh, that section on eternal security is a great read. I highly recommend you read that this week. So how will we follow the one true shepherd this week? Let's pray. Well, once again, dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this uh, chapter 10 in this book. And as even as we begin uh, next week into chapter 11 and we see the raising of Lazarus and uh, the, even the beginning of uh, of the end of Jesus' ministry and 
uh, all the things that go on. Uh, we pray that you would continue to speak to us through your word, that you would uh, grant us wisdom and grace as we study and as we as we read and as we um, share with those around us. Uh, I pray that as we do those questions that you would um, help us and guide us, uh, direct us. And uh, once again, we just pray a special blessing on these men tonight as they drive home. Give us uh, traveling mercies and safety. Um, bring us back safely next week. We ask this all in your son's name. Amen.